Welcome to uh, CST 302, week 5, lecture 1. There will also be an exam review um, lecture for this week, and then of course your second exam is required this week as well. Um, the uh, lecture today is going to talk about some items that we've already covered some, but also want to clarify as well as make certain that you're prepared for your exam um, and uh, that you understand the aspect of Orthodox Christian thought, or as the class is titled, Introduction to Christian Thought. And our thought and our theology is based on what has been Orthodox throughout the years of Christian history uh, since the New Testament time and what we derive from Scripture and bring together as our thought process in regards to uh, not only what we believe as Orthodox Christians, um, but also as that affects, um, you know, our worldview and our view of salvation, what it means to be saved. And so we'll be talking about redemption accomplished, even though much of what you'll see in this has to some degree or another been covered in previous lectures. You'll still need this information and trust it will challenge you as well as help you in your preparation for your exam. Uh, this week in this course. So let's talk about the doctrine of salvation. And in regards to the doctrine of salvation, we are talking about soteriology. And soteriology, that suffixology, is the study of, and it's the study of salvation, uh, the study of what it means to be saved. That's what that word means. And the two components, again, that we've talked about some already deal with redemption accomplished and redemption applied. And the redemption that's already been accomplished is what has been accomplished through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Thus, we've dealt with um, Jesus being God and man, the, the person of who Jesus Christ was. But also, we've talked about how Christ and Christ alone can do what he has done um, to accomplish redemption uh, for those that are saved. And so, uh, that's the redemption that's accomplished. And then the redemption that's applied deals with the person and the work of the Holy Spirit and the way that salvation is carried out within an individual human being. The person and work of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus promised in John chapter 14 and in the Gospel of John chapter 16, that when he returned to the Father, which we have record of in Acts chapter 1, at the very beginning of the chapter there, the, the uh, disciples see him ascend, uh, back into heaven, and uh, he said after that time the Holy Spirit would be given, and so the Holy Spirit is given, the, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God, God himself, um, then does the work or the application of uh, what Christ has already accomplished in regards to our salvation, and, and the order of that in our life, as we've mentioned previously, is the regeneration, the fact that the Holy Spirit regenerates us, brings us to that new life or being born again, as Jesus explained in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. And then the justification, which means we now stand legally justified before God because of what Christ accomplished that is applied or put upon us, imputed to us. And then the sanctification is that process of Christian living that we carry out on a day-to-day -day basis, that we're being sanctified, we're being set apart, God's making us more and more holy, as the Apostle Peter in his letter says, you are to be holy for I am holy, says the Lord. And so he's working out that sanctification process within us, and then ultimately our glorification. And you can see that order not only in what we've discussed previously, but in Romans chapter 8 as well. And so the study of salvation is involved with these two specific components. Now, Christology, or that ology, or study of Christ, deals with two primary elements, and we've already talked about these. The person of Christ, who Jesus Christ is as God and human, uh, born of the Virgin, fully man and yet fully God at the same time, that hypostatic union, um, but then also the work of Christ, which is uh, what Christ did on our behalf, um, his incarnation as we mentioned, being born of the virgin, that's God coming in the flesh, not born of the seed of man, of Adam, therefore not having this sin nature, but being born of a woman, therefore being fully human. So it's that incarnation, 
Then that work of Christ involves his life of obedience. We've talked about his passive and active obedience. But then also his sacrificial and atoning death um, that he sacrificed himself for us. And then ultimately his resurrection, uh, which uh, takes him to glory as he prayed in John chapter 17, that the glory he shared with the Father before coming to earth he would once again um, realize. And so there's an importance in our study of Christ, and um, we should be challenged to study and continue to grow and learn in our understanding of Christ, as has been said by Pelican, that regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, so you may choose not to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but as Pelican says, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for 20 centuries. And uh, that's true. That's true. And, and so um, there's an important aspect to knowing about Jesus Christ, especially for those of us who are believers. But then there are also challenges to Christology or the study and knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And those come from outside the church, from obvious sources, those who are liberal, those who don't take the Bible uh, for what the Bible teaches, those who are Gnostics, who don't see Jesus Christ as fully God and fully human, and that the Spirit is really the only thing that mattered. And then there are other world religions, um, such as Islam, that would uh, even claim that Jesus was a prophet, um, but they would not give him the recognition that Orthodox Christianity does uh, from Scripture that recognizes Jesus Christ as being the incarnate Son of God, God in the flesh. So they don't, they wouldn't recognize that. So they would challenge our view of Christ in that way. But then there's also challenges inside the church. People who uh, believe they are Christians, call themselves Christians, and may even be Christians, but perhaps just don't fully know and understand what the Bible teaches about Christ. And so in this course, Introduction to Christian Thought, I trust that it'll be a springboard and it'll be that which launches you into a greater desire to know more and more about Jesus Christ, about God, his salvation, his redemption, all that he's done for us, so that we, as Christians, um, won't be led astray, and so that our view of Christ would truly be held in as high regard as the Scripture holds Jesus Christ, and we'd not be caught in ignorance or neglect of the truth of in regards to Jesus Christ from God's word. The person of Christ, as we've mentioned, uh, the Bible makes it clear that Jesus is fully divine. Um, the names of God are applied to Jesus Christ. The attributes of God are applied to Jesus Christ. His actions are those of which only God uh, could bring about, such as the forgiveness of sin. And Jesus doesn't refuse worship, worship that would only be due unto God. So Jesus is fully divine, but Jesus is also fully human. And again, that's part of our understanding of who Jesus is, is that he's fully God and fully man. He's not half God and half man, or part God and part man, or sometimes man and sometimes God. No, he is at all time fully God and fully human. Uh, he went through physical birth, um, as we know, through Mary. Um, he grew and he developed. The Bible talks about him growing in wisdom and in stature which means physical growth and development. Uh, we know the scripture tells us that there were times he was hungry, there were times he was thirsty, uh, there were times he was tired, he expressed uh, human emotion. And so Jesus is a single individual and a person, but a person with two natures. And that's important that we understand that when we get to some of the heresies in just a moment. Those were some of the issues that were dealt with at the different church councils. And so from these Christological heresies, we need to recognize, in uh, recognizing these heresies, I want to make it clear to you, this will be um, a sizable portion of your test that's coming up. And understanding the heresies, as well as the councils that dealt with them, uh, but primarily the heresies, those which were not orthodox, were not true uh, to what the Bible teaches, and um, as a result, you need to be able to identify those uh, because they will be on the exam. Uh, we've touched on these again, but I want to make sure you have them here in the form 
uh, that's easily accessible and understandable. And uh, we'll briefly mention these again, because like I said, last week's lecture, we had those uh, covered. Uh, but I uh, want to make sure you're familiar with them because this will be a, a fairly sizable matching portion. So you'll just need to have the name along with the definition uh, in regards to uh, these heresies that will be uh, listed on your exam. There's docetism, which means just an appearance of or seeming and that he was only divine. And so it divided his fully divine and fully human nature. Uh, the adoptionism and ebionitism, um, that he was merely human, um, his Gnosticism, that um, there was some secret in, and some um, spiritual aspect and enlightenment that only came to a certain few. Um, there, was an Arian, there was Arianism that um, Jesus was created. Jesus was not created. He has always existed eternally as part of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Uh, or the Holy Spirit. Apollinarianism, um, that there was only a physical body and not a soul. Um, Nestori Nest Nestorianism, um, that it was actually two different people that were there. And then Eutychianism and Monophysitism, um, which mixed his combination of divinity and humanity. And then Monothelitism, uh, that it was his um, divine will that overpowered his human will. It was not a complete subjection. And so again, um, all of these have been dealt with in more detail in previous lectures and would encourage you to, to go back and review them as well as draw from your reading so that you have not only an identification of each one, but also can define each one when you see them in a list um, on your exam that's coming up. So just want to give you a heads up with that. And then part of the history in regards to those heresies comes from the seven um, ecumenical councils. The ecumenical councils that have happened uh, throughout the course of church history um, deal with the heresies that we had just mentioned. And again, those heresies you can find in uh, detail in previous lectures and in your reading. Just make certain that you're familiar with them. But uh, in these uh, councils will just note, um, as we see going back all the way to 325 um, AD, the Council of Nicaea affirmed that the Son is homoousios, of the same substance with the Father. We, we dealt with that um, in regards to the uh, hypostatic union, and that condemned uh, Arian and Arianism in regards to understanding that Christ is fully human as well as fully. Uh, divine, and then the Council of Constantinople uh, about 55 years later, and uh, it reaffirmed the Council of Nicaea and broadened or made a fuller statement on the Holy Spirit of God, and uh, that dealt with the Arianism and Apollinarianism, uh, the controversy there, and condemned those as heresies. And it, it's important to understand you're going back centuries, almost two millennia, to these early councils and understanding that even back then and as close as these church leaders were to the original apostles and the original writings that they took very seriously the what God's Word taught and the truth of Orthodox Christianity and thus the need to deal with um, those who also in the early church had misunderstandings or were purposely teaching what was wrong and so uh, these councils met the Council of Ephesus about another 50 years later, um, it turn, uh, affirmed Mary as the one who was uh, the virgin that gave birth, Theokotos, the God-bearer, and thus affirmed the unity of Christ's person, where Mary, as we mentioned, was the human uh, parent of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Christ was human, but she was she conceived by uh, the Holy Spirit. And therefore, it was uh, the, the offspring was fully God by the Holy Spirit and fully human, being born of a human being, Mary. And so uh, that dealt with the Nestorianism and the heresy there. And then just a couple of decades later, the Council of Chalcedon uh, defined the, hypostat the hypostatic union um, where Christ is one person with two natures. And uh, again, you can see the 
the um, heresies that were condemned there, the Arianism, the Apollinarianism, the Eutych Eutychianism, and the Nestorian Nestorianism. Sorry, I'm stumbling all these over all these isms. And um, again, just made clear the church's stance from the earliest of years in regards to the nature of Jesus Christ and being fully God and fully human. And then the council at Con the second council at Constantinople in uh, about 80 years later in 553 uh, condemned the Nestorians um, and reaffirmed that the person of Christ is the second person of the Trinity. You can go back to the first council, but also here again, even uh, well over 100 years later, there were still those who were introducing unbiblical concepts in regards to understanding God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that all three are God. Um, and uh, they are three persons, but they are one in essence. That's such a vital concept when you look at the history of Orthodox Christianity. And so uh, would encourage you to further study that on your own, although what you've read and what we've talked about really just gives you a solid foundation in regards to understanding the importance of the Trinity as an Orthodox Christian doctrine. And then the third council at Constantinople um, affirmed that the Son has two wills or two energies tied to his two natures. See, he was both fully God and fully human, so he had a human aspect. As the book of Hebrews says, he could empathize with us in all things because he was fully human. He was tempted in all ways as we are, as the book of Hebrews says, but he did not sin. And um, so he, had, he was both God and human. Um, but dealt fully with and understands everything that we as humans deal with because of his human nature, and there was a fullness to that nature. And then the Second Council of Nicaea affirmed the orthodoxy of venerating icons, and um, that's called iconoclas iconoclasm, uh, and unfortunately that was later rejected by many Protestants due to the danger of idolatry. Um, we in this computer age all know what an icon is, but long before computers, there were icons or symbols that stood for and represented, and not that a symbol or a representation in, a, in and of itself is bad. However, when it became such an object of worship as just the symbol and not what the symbol represented, uh, then it was later rejected by many in Orthodox Christianity. And so, uh, just a footnote there to the history of uh, the seven ecumenical councils um, throughout uh, the early days of church history. And then some key defenders of orthodoxy. Again, we've talked about some of these, and um, they are those who, um, as an introduction, you can see their names, but as a desire for further study, these would be people who, through the earliest centuries, stood for Christian orthodoxy and um, are really known as the early church fathers in regards to leadership in understanding and in teaching and in writing and in defending and in apologetics of the early Christian faith. And so uh, to read these as Christian classics um, would certainly be beneficial to your, um, to your study of theology. There's Irenaeus, Tertullian, Athanasius, the Cappadocian fathers, Gregory, Basil, and Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory of Nyssiansis, um, Augustine, Cyril of Alexander, and Maximus. And uh, so again, these as reference points uh, for um, tangents that if you would like to go off and study more on your own, these would all be valid and seen as orthodox in both their teaching, their defense, and their understanding of historical orthodox Christianity. And so would recommend any of those to you. Um, We've mentioned the work of Christ in the threefold office of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. And uh, that's the fulfillment as well as the intercessor and the ultimate ruler and defender in regards to Jesus Christ and uh, the threefold, threefold office that he holds. Um, and then again, we've mentioned his sinless obedience, both actively and passively, his active obedience in keeping the law, never violating the law um, in his life here, 
but also his passive obedience by surrendering himself to an atoning death. And again, if that sounds familiar, we've touched on those topics in previous lectures. And uh, you'll want to make certain that you're uh, familiar with the threefold office as well as uh, those aspects of obedient, obedience uh, for your exam that's coming up. Um, the atonement theories. And again, we've talked about all of these already. You can see them in previous lectures, so I'm not going to go through them in any length or detail. But you need to be familiar enough with them, and this will be a matching section on your exam in regards to um, knowing what each one is by general definition and um, being able to match those. Again, this and the heresies and understanding those heresies that we talked about by definition and by matching is what you'll need to know on the exam. And so make certain that you're familiar with the recapitulation theory, the ransom theory, the Christus Victor theory, the satisfaction theory, the moral influence and moral government theories, and the penal substitution theory. Um, and again, you can see just a real brief uh, definition there, but you'll want to be familiar with that uh, for your exam. And then um, the theories as we see them from a scriptural standpoint with Christ as our substitution, Christ, Christ as our propitiation, the one who satisfies God's wrath. And make sure you get that clear for your exam. Uh, propitiation is where Christ satisfied the wrath of God. And expiation is where Christ took our sin and removed it from us in regards to uh, salvation. And uh, he revealed his victory through the resurrection over all um, authority, uh, as the New Testament teaches. And then the aspect of reconciliation, reconciliation that's us being restored to a relationship with God. Um, we just mentioned the resurrection. And it's vital that we understand that there was an actual physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, as he even testified to himself on one instance when he met with the disciples in the upper room. And uh, they thought they saw what they would call a ghost when, in fact, Jesus sat and ate a meal with them. So he had a physical body, a physically resurrected, victorious body. And then he ascended, as we mentioned earlier, in Acts chapter 1, as it's recorded for us, where they saw him ascend back into heaven, where he is seated at the Father's right hand. And then subsequently in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the gift of the Holy Spirit was given, as was promised in John's Gospel, chapter 14 and chapter 16. And then Christ now, as Hebrews chapter 4 says he intercedes for us, seated at the right hand of the Father, um, interceding for those that are his. And then we anticipate and look forward to a physical and bodily second coming of Christ as well. So that's a good summary of the work of Christ as we have studied it and have learned about it to this point. Um, in regards to worldviews, and we've, we've read about and discussed worldviews early on in this course, salvation is really the distinguishing feature of the Christian worldview. In other words, how someone receives salvation, how someone enters into eternal life, how someone can have a personal relationship with the Almighty Creator God of the universe. Um, and, and other worldviews conceive of this in radically different ways as the Eastern religions deal basically with this continual cycle of hope and not even a conscious state but but trying to get to a place that they somehow feel they can work their way up to um, and then even today philosophically with modernism and postmodernism and progressivism um, that that like darwin proclaimed this survival of the fittest um, and pop psychology and self-help theories of you're good enough and you can do it. Let me make it absolutely crystal clear. The only way you can come into a right relationship with God Almighty is through personally receiving the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. That's salvation. And that completely distinguishes Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, from all other worldviews. For in all other worldviews, there's some aspect of the human being involved in the salvation or the ultimate goal of whatever 
um, is believed, whether it's nirvana or whatever, of arriving at in fulfillment. But in Christianity, it deals with what Horton calls, and you'll, you'll come across it if you have not finished all of your reading in chapter 10, where he talks about monergism and synergism. And monergism is that aspect that God and God alone saves. And uh, it's due to nothing on our part. And that's the distinction between Christianity and every other worldview. In every other worldview, there's something that the human has to do. And the reason that's so popular is because it feeds into our own pride and self-existence of who I am and what I can do when truly and only in humility can one receive the great gift of God that is salvation. And so that's the difference. Monergism, the fact that God and God alone saves and it has nothing to do with me or anything that I can do. I play no part in it um, other than just receiving the gift. And it's all that he has already done for me. Where in every other faith system and religious view, there's something that a human being has to do. Let me just share with you for a moment personally. I'm so grateful to God that my salvation, my relationship with him, and my eternity doesn't rest in anything that I can do. But it's just a trust in all that he has done and how he's made that known through the Bible, through his word. And so I'm grateful to God for that. Well, I trust that uh, this has been an encouragement to you. Let me, as always, encourage you to stay up with your reading and your weekly assignments and um, watch the review video for the uh, examination that's coming up. And uh, if I can help you in any way, Please don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, I enjoy our time together, and I trust God's blessings on you.